Hello everybody, welcome back to the ASUS ROG YouTube page. This is JJ once again and we're bringing you guys some information that you guys requested. Prior to the AMD 900 series chipset launch, we asked you guys on Facebook what were you most interested in, see most interested in seeing um, about our series of motherboards that related to this chipset. And the number one most requested breakdown was regarding overclocking on the platform. So that's what we're going to be covering in depth here today. Um, there's definitely going to be a lot more information if you head over to our ASUS ROG forum page and you're going to see a lot of uh, feedback from, from guys that we have internally here on the team, uh, possibly myself or other guys that we have uh, all working with us that are going to be giving you guys insights and tips on how to tweak, tune, configure your platform to get the, the best overclocks possible on your system. But we're initially going to jump into some of the basic tenets as far as how you can go ahead and customize the experience uh, and how you can overclock your platform when you're working with it. So let's go ahead and first take a look at what components we are running here as part of our overclock platform. So first and foremost, we've got of course here our Crosshair 5 formula motherboard. This is our 990FX uh, series motherboard. Being that it's part of the ROG series, its definite focus is about innovative performance. Um, high overclocking ability, and of course, uh, gaming-based technologies, whether that's in multi-GPU or special packet priority software uh, for the network controller. There's a whole slew of different functions and features that this board offers, but we're going to be focusing on overclocking. So that's the Crosshair 5 formula. As far as a GPU, we're using a ASUS GTX 560 DirectCU 2 graphics card featuring our Super Alloy Power Delivery System. As far as the SSD that we're going to be working with the platform, it's Corsair's P-Series SSD. Uh, we've decided to go with an SSD as opposed to a mechanical hard drive just because it's going to allow us for much quicker boots in between any settings or adjustments that we make in the UEFI or any potential crashes as we're overclocking the system, anything along those lines. So it allows us to go ahead and load up our applications more quickly, run benchmarks uh, that much faster, and overall just get a faster level of response from the system. Keep in mind though that in some situations when you're overclocking, um, some adjustments that can, can be made to the system, uh, whether they're PCIe based uh, in terms of the UEFI settings or some other parameters that make adjustments, sometimes seem to have a little bit less um, wiggle room when you're utilizing a SSD as opposed to a mechanical hard drive. So if you were to utilize a mechanical hard drive, there's a possibility that you might be able to get uh, just that much more out of it and, and under certain configurations. Um, it's not a huge factor, and for most of you guys that are overclocking, there should be too much of a differential, but it is something to keep in mind. In terms of uh, the memory that we're utilizing, we're utilizing Corsair's Dominator GT. So this is their flagship, flagship series of memory. It's really performance oriented. Um, we're running four DIMMs. Uh, this is actually a memory that's rated up to 2133, which on AMD is uh, quite a feat if you can actually run 2030, 2133. We're not going to be pushing it that high here today, but we've gone ahead and gone with a very high speed kit based worth of memory, 2133 C9 at 1.5 volts, uh, to be able to give us flexibility and be able to push up the memory as well as uh, push up our CPU if we make any adjustments uh, to the HT clocks or, or any of the things as we're going through overclocking. Now, one important note to also keep in mind that sometimes people forget about is as you populate more modules in your system and as you increase the density of those modules, so an example of this is I'm running four sticks of memory. Now, if I was, let's say, maybe only running two sticks of memory, this is actually going to be considerably easier for me to overclock um, on the system than it would be four sticks. The main reason being is, is that when you're overclocking, memory, you're accessing a part of the CPU that's called the IMC, the Integrated Memory Controller. And the more memory that you put onto the system, the more stress that you put on that IMC. Now that IMC has been rated for a certain rated specification. When you start to exceed that, you start to put a lot more stress on it. And keep in mind that we're also then pushing it past its rated frequency, so its normal clock speed. So we want to try to kind of balance out and realize that just because we have four DIMMs, just because they're 2133, doesn't mean that our IMC is actually going to be able to do that, even if we've spent our time at optimizing our boards to be able to give you those levels of speeds. So there's, there's a lot of variables in overclocking, uh, and, and there's definitely no guarantees. Um, but when you mix the right hardware, you definitely can increase the likelihood, uh, such as in our situation, we're picking a lot of really good parts. So we're giving us our best chance to get some really high grade performance. But uh, keep in mind that you know, it's going to be always easier and less stressful and able to generally go to higher speeds when you go with a lower count of dims. So if I was to do two as opposed to four, and also going to be easier if I was using two gigabyte modules, as I'm using here, these are four two gigs, so eight gigs, as opposed to 
um, maybe utilizing Corsair's Vengeance Space Memory, which are fantastic kits. Those are DDR3-1600, but they're four gig DIMMs. Um, so that's going to place a lot more stress as well. So you got a lot of different ways you can cut it, but just something to keep in mind. In terms of the CPU that we're running on here, this is an AMD hex core based CPU, so six base, six core base CPU, uh, 1055T with an unlock multiplier, so that's going to go ahead and give us a lot of flexibility when overclocking. But definitely as part of that, we need a really strong platform in terms of helping us to make sure that we can keep it nice and cool. So we're going to be using Corsair's H60 closed loop uh, water cooling system. Uh, this is a, a great series cooler that's just been released here from Corsair. Gives us a lot of flexibility in being able to deal with much higher temperatures. Um, we're going to probably be shooting for hopefully about a 1 gigahertz overclock from our base frequency, which is about 2.8 gigahertz, and the H60 can definitely take care of that for you. Um, one of the nice things about it as well is that uh, Corsair has tweaked and tuned this kit to be able to give you a high level of performance, but while keeping the nose profile down, which, um, you know, we want to be able to have both things. We want to be able to overclock, but also not have, a, have our system sound like a jet engine. Um, powering the entire system is definitely also a critical component because as you're overclocking, you're pushing a lot of different parts, you're doing different things, you need to make sure to ensure real solid clean power delivery. So we've gone ahead and tapped Corsair's AX850 watt gold PSU. Gold meaning it's 90% plus efficiency. Um, it's also a, a fantastic power supply in the fact that it's fully modular so we can go ahead and just have just the cables that we need for our system as we have it set up. And because of the high rate of efficiency, we're keeping actually uh, the nose profile down because it's not requiring the actual fan to speed up and produce more ambient noise. As you can see pretty much here at the test bed, it's pretty silent. So it's, it's, a, it's a great platform to work with even though we're dealing with pretty much uh, a lot of really high-end parts here. And of course, lastly here, we have our awesome Demus Tech ROG Edition test bed station that we're going to be running with. So we're going to go ahead and now jump into the UEFI and give you guys some of the initial starting points. But I'm not actually going to do a lot of tweaking and tuning in here. The main reason being is because uh, I think there's a lot easier way to be able to go ahead and get an idea of what type of adjustments you need to do. Uh, to be able to go ahead and get up in terms of your clock frequency. So all I'm really going to do here is initially set my memory speed that I want to work with and then we're just going to boot straight into the OS. So we've gone ahead and accessed the UEFI. Now within the UEFI interface what we're going to go ahead and do is select AI Overclock Tuner. Now this is going to allow us to go ahead and either pick manual or DOCP mode. Now, it's important to remember that for AMD's architecture, by default, the memory dividers that they support are limited up to 10, excuse me, uh, 1600. So that means 1600 megahertz. Anything over that is not a supported memory divider officially. Um, the guys over here in the ASUS labs, though, we've done some pretty cool stuff that if we go ahead and select the DOCP, we actually have some internal values that we've created that allow you to go much higher than that. As you can see, we have 1600, 1800, 1866. 2000, 2133, 2200, 2400. So you can see that we've really tweaked and tuned this board to be able to give you really outstanding values if matched with the right memory and the right CPU that has a really good IMC. So this is a nice way of allowing you to utilize higher performance kits with the system that normally wouldn't be supported on competitors' uh, products. Now in addition, we also have one last option which is pretty cool too. Here we can see we have a profile table. Now this profile table is pretty nice because there's not what's called XMP supported on AMD chipsets. Um, XMP is kind of a, uh, a set of timings that is set up by the memory vendor that uh, when enabled it will automatically define that frequency, those timings, and those voltage tables for you. Since we don't have that available here, normally you'd have to take a look at the memory. The memory would have some type of rated specification on it and you'd have to go ahead and make sure to enter these manually into um, all the areas in the BIOS, the UEFI, to go ahead and have your memory work at those rated speeds. Our focus to make things easier for you when overclocking, we've enabled actually the ability to go ahead and read that profile table and go ahead and log it in. So that's a pretty easy way in terms of being able to access that. Now one important note though is to keep in mind that sometimes the rating tables that you might see on a kit of memory aren't always the same between an AMD and an Intel platform. Right now, AMD and Intel both fully utilize DDR3 memory, but doesn't always mean that that DDR3 is going to run at the same speed, same voltage, and same timings on one uh, platform as it is going to be on the other. So definitely always check the manufacturer's website in terms of the memory that you're going to be utilizing. 
Corsair does a fantastic job at working at both platforms and really optimizing their memory uh, for AMD as well as Intel. So for us right now, uh, as is, we're using a great set of memory here and, and we want to go past the normal memory divider because we're overclocking our system. We're going to go ahead and start off with a pretty aggressive level, but we're not going to shoot up to uh, a crazy uh, speed because as I said, that's going to put a lot more stress on the IMC, especially if we were to try to run the 2133. So I'm going to go ahead and select 1866. From there, that 1866 will actually make all the adjustments I need accordingly uh, to go ahead and set that for me. So I don't pretty much have to do anything at this point. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just manually set the DRAM voltage to 1.5 because that's what the memory is rated for. And then wait, I don't have to worry about the, the memory ever getting any higher voltage uh, than I'd like it to. So from there, I'm also going to go ahead and uh, set my actual fan speed on that little unit there for the H60 to user mode to go ahead and give me a low speed target temperature of 25C for low operation and if it ever gets up to 60C uh, then I'll go ahead and crank it up higher to go ahead and give me a higher level of performance. Um, this is one of the reasons why uh, ROG boards have always really shined in terms of fan customization ability is that we give you the ability to go ahead and define the CP fan control, chassis fan control, and up to three additional optional fan headers. So depending on our overclock parameters that we define, we get a lot of flexibility from that. So next step from here is we're going to go ahead and jump out of the UFI and get into the operating system. Okay, so our system's now gone ahead and posted. Now, you might not be able to necessarily see it, but over here on the corner edge of the board, there is actually a series of four LEDs. These little four LEDs actually are what's called QLED. This is a diagnostic system that we built onto the motherboard. This little diagnostic system actually will let you know whether everything is working correctly in terms of starting up and posting right. Now, in some situations, you might be too aggressive in sometimes the settings that you define for your system. If it locks on one of those LEDs, you can easily check and see, is it on the CPU, is it on the DRAM, is it on the VGA, or it is on the boot device. Looking into that information kind of gives you a clue into knowing, oh, where, my, my, where there might be a problem. If, take for instance, maybe you set too aggressive a DRAM, it would lock the little light on the DRAM LED. See if we can maybe show you guys on here. And here you can see it. Four little LEDs. They're running right here along the bottom. And one says actually DRAM LED. In the event it were to lock there from either maybe a frequency overclock or a memory overclock, you can go ahead and actually always press this button, go button, while the system is on, and it actually will do like a semi-clear CMOS and reset your memory timings to some values that the system can go ahead and start with. Of course, you also have the option to go ahead and access the clear CMOS button on the back of the motherboard, which would also do the same thing. But we do spend a good amount of time uh, internally to make sure that our boards have a strong OC recovery mechanism. And that means that if you get too aggressive, uh, the board will attempt to cut, try to reset some values and try to bounce back and work with that. Um, there are also some other really cool options that if you take advantage of the ROG Connect feature, once you actually have this inside of a chassis, uh, you don't have access to this mem button and to this clear CMOS button. So how would you go ahead and do something like that? So stay tuned for that because we'll dive into that a little bit later. So we've gone ahead now and gone to the operating system. Now some of you might be wondering, well why didn't I stay in the UEFI and why didn't I do all the tweaking and tuning there? While our UEFI is extensive and it's groundbreaking in terms of the amount of options and ranges that we give you, especially with the flexibility of having so many manual values that can be tweaked and tuned, manually entered with the keyboard. Uh, we don't have to use any plus and minus. We can be real accurate in terms of how we want to do that. I feel that we can actually get a lot more flexibility from within the operating system, and I'm going to show you why. So I'm going to go ahead and open up CPU-Z, ROG Edition. This is going to go ahead and allow us to see currently what our system is overclocked to. So right now we can see that uh, when we actually set the memory to 1866, we automatically overclock the CPU already. We've already jumped up to now 3.4 gigahertz. So we're not only running faster than stock because stock was only 2.8, but we're also now running our memory at 1866. Now I also personally really like ADA as another option. If we go ahead and open up ADA just for comparison, 
we can also open up their CPU ID tool. And with their tool, we get even a little bit more information. As we can see here on the same page, it'll show us there's our motherboard, and actually here's our memory type running at 1878 C9. So we know that pretty much everything's now gone into effect. So at this point, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to actually open up a brand new application that we have that we recently released on our RG boards a while back ago. Uh, this is our AI Suite 2 application. This program gives us access to the UEFI in a, in a very accurate and hardware level oriented mechanism. Um, we can essentially have access to the DigiPlus VRM that we have on here and all the options that we have within the UEFI, but real time within the OS. You can see here such items as our CPU's load line calibration. Load line calibration is a way that you can counter what's called droop. Uh, by default, your CPU follows a standard path in terms of the amount of voltage that applies depending on the frequency that it's running at. But this voltage will droop down as part of a rated design specification as you put it under increased load. But in some situations, as you incre increase the CPU frequency, you're going to want to go ahead and maybe potentially counteract that. Um, you know, you're going to get a lot of different variances, different people are going to tell you different things. Um, ideally, I would usually recommend you know, consider always starting off with um, not applying any type of LLC to the system. Oh, I think our guys might have been overclocking a little bit too hard. Let's go ahead and check on them and we'll get back to you guys in a second. All right, we're back guys. Yeah, the guys in the other room, they were busting out the liquid helium. They were getting a little crazy with the Crosshair 5 port. So uh, uh, now that we've got that all sorted out, let's uh, jump back to the overclocking here. So, as we were talking uh, previously before about load light calibration, usually I recommend, you know, try to actually run with the system or consider having no load line actually applied. Um, this is going to allow you to go ahead and work with the droop and you can kind of see in accordance as you read the voltage, you'll see how much it drops down. This allows you to keep a little bit more kind of efficient system and maintain a lower, lower consistent level of voltage that's supplied to the CPU. And the other advantage is it's going to produ produce generally lower operating temperatures under idle as well as under load. Um, for right now, we're just going to go ahead and go with the auto presets that the board has gone ahead and applied now that we've done an overclock. And it's doing this to go ahead and ensure stability as it knows that because we're running a higher frequency for the CPU and we're running um, a higher memory divider, that has gone ahead and auto applied these to ensure better stability. So as you can see here, we've got a whole bunch of different options. But our board has a really strong uh, set of what's called auto rules, so we're not going to really go ahead and tuss, tuss, excuse me, adjust any of these. But for you guys that are interested, definitely check out, like I said, the forums where we can go into specifically each what one of these values are defined. Or if you guys are interested, definitely leave us comments on the page. But for me, we're going to go ahead and jump into Turbo V Evo portion of AI Suite 2. Turbo V Evo is going to allow us to access the key components uh, for overclocking that we're most interested in which are going to be the voltages and the multiplier. Now, although we have CPU-Z here, if you didn't even have it installed, the great thing is that AI Suite 2 gives you everything you need access to. So right here we can see we have the full load for the CPU, as well as we actually also have the CPU frequency displayed. And very easily, if I want temperature information, I can go to Monitor, click on Sensor, and then have all my temperatures. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is just leave it open like this. And now I'm actually going to go ahead and open up a stress test. Personally, I prefer ADA64 and running its stress test. The main reason being is that the guys over there have spent a lot of time in tweaking and tuning their test application to consistently be updated to support the latest generation of processors, chipsets, motherboards as they're released. And they've also designed their stress test to be in relation to the design envelope for that uh, CPU. And that's important because it's meant to work with it as opposed to necessarily against it where it could damage it. Um, there's also another important factor in terms that sometimes CPUs have new functions that are built into them that as part of the stress test you would want uh, tested or pushed, but basic programs like Prime95, which a lot of people use, actually don't do things like this. Um, they're pure, generally floating point. Um, they're generally based on some type of integer-based processing, which while can be quite stressful, isn't always 100% uh, reliable in terms of determining the stability of the CPU uh, the memory or even the platform, but it can be used definitely as a valid metric. Um, what I ideally would recommend is consider using something like um, ADA64 or if you wanted to Prime95, but also make sure to use something that mirrors your normal usage model. As you can see here, I've got FutureMarks 3 Mark 11 
and FutureMark's PC Mark 7. These are two great benchmarks. PC Mark 7 being a really, really good one because what it does is it runs a huge amount of different types of tests accessing the CPU, the memory, the storage system, the graphics card, utilizing the system actually as you would utilize it. This is a great way to see if your overclock is potentially affected one other part of the motherboard, which it can definitely do. Sometimes uh, you can have your Prime 95 pass um, for you know an hour and think, okay, my CPU frequency, my memory frequency, everything's okay, and then all of a sudden you go to jump on and you know play a Call of Duty Black Ops and it crashes five minutes into it because maybe the hard drive had a little bit of an inadvertent sensitivity to that overclock. So, you know, I recommend that if you pass your basic stress test, try out something like PC Mark 7, try out Future Mark 11, uh, excuse me, 3D Mark 11, uh, you know, or just try normal usage and see if then it's, it holds through in terms of stability. But for the point of this video, we're just gonna go ahead and now launch Prime 95. We're gonna launch Blend, which is gonna go ahead and access both the CPU as well as the memory. Now, some people might be asking, well, why am I running the stress test at the same time? Um, the main reason being is because this gives us a nice advantage of actually fully stressing out the system and continuing to overclock it within the operating system. So at this point, I can switch back to monitor, and if I go to CPU frequency, we can see that we're still running at my 3.4, and we can now see that the CPU utilization has gone up to 100%. So I'm fully using the system and also voltage drooping, if, if it's gone into effect, is now present because now I've applied a full load to the system. So from here, you can go ahead and run it for however as long as you would want. Uh, you know, different people have different comments. Um, in most situations, while generally longer is better, the reality is that in most situations, if a failure is going to occur, it's going to be fairly immediate, probably within the first 30 seconds, uh, if not even sometimes sooner. Um, the first 10 minutes can also be quite telling period that usually if it passes 10 minutes, it's going to probably pass one hour. Um, so, because nobody wants to sit and wait around here forever, usually I would tell you to, to go at least about an hour uh, of testing. If it can pass about an hour of testing, you should be okay to go ahead and move to your next stability test and then go ahead and see if everything's okay. Um, for the point of this video though, we're going to go ahead and move a little bit faster through this process and we're going to assume, okay, everything's gone ahead and maintained system has not crashed, it's not posted like a blue screen or a stop error, which would indicate something is off, whether it is that uh, we have too little voltage or that we need to tweak and tune some other parameter. So one of the really cool options that we have with AI Suite 2 is we have full multiplier control within the operating system. This communicates with our UEFI, our TPU chip, and our ROG chip that's on the motherboard to make adjustments on the fly. So what we can go ahead and now do is Go ahead and set this to 15. And we can see that this now is actually making an adjustment to 3.5. Now what I'm gonna go ahead and do to allow me to more easily scale the CPU is I'm gonna go ahead and raise up the V-Core. Now, there's a couple of different ways you could do it. Um, some different people might wanna go ahead and raise lightly and then see if it crashes and then reboots. But it's the whole point that I'd like to illustrate here is that you can go ahead and keep scaling up a lot of the time without having to go through all these reboots I'm going to actually go ahead and shoot for a little bit higher V-Core. So I'm going to actually shoot all the way up to about um, 1.25. Now this is maybe a little bit, of course, uh, well this is considerably higher than the voltage that's required to run at this speed. But the advantage is that now that I've bumped up to that level, I can go ahead and just keep scaling up, keep scaling up until I essentially reach my blocking point. So what you might want to do is go ahead and, you know, decide on what voltage level you're comfortable with and then scale up and keep seeing how much you can raise the multiplier until the system essentially crashes. That's an initial indicator that m you might have run uh, with too little voltage for that corresponding speed, or you could have possibly maybe hit the limit of your cooling, or you could possibly hit the limit of the CPU as well. Uh, for the temperatures, as I noted before, you can also always just go to the sensor and it tells you actually what is the CPU temperature. So here we can see now with this increased voltage, we've increased the temperature to now 56C but we're also still running our fan only in silent level. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and continue a little bit further. We've bumped it up already to 3.5 gigahertz. We're running at 1866. Let's go ahead and continue to go a little bit more. So we now, uh, let's go ahead and just jump straight to 16. 16 is gonna go ahead and give us 3.7 gigahertz. So now we're definitely starting to ratchet up that frequency. We're almost already at one gigahertz in terms of the overclock. 
Now, one important factor to also remember on AMD is as you can see here, you have multiple cores that's available to you, and I can actually adjust the cores independently of each other. This is really cool because when you overclock, just because you can get to a certain frequency uh, or assign that frequency doesn't mean that all the cores can support running at that. In some situations, depending on what you, the user, are looking to do, you might maybe actually want to go ahead and clock up one core more so than the other cores. This will allow you to get much better single thread performance with that higher frequency. But if you're a user that's using heavily multi-threaded applications, you might need to go with a little bit lower frequency spread out across all the cores. But ultimately, it's up to you and the applications that you're going to be using. So we continue to see here that uh, everything's holding solid. We're not having any issues. And it's been quite easy. I haven't had to do any type of rebooting. I continue to just keep overclocking my system with those base adjustments that I already made. So we're going to go ahead and try to round it out, see if we can do 17. That's actually going to give us over a 1 gigahertz overclock, and that's pretty impressive in my opinion. And we're going to go ahead and ultimately set that to 3.978 in terms of the, uh, the frequency rating, so just shy of 4 gigahertz, 6 core, running with 1866 memory. That's a pretty tricked out system. Now, as we can see here, also AI Suite 2 is doing its job and letting us know, hey, the CPU frequency, excuse me, the CPU temperature has exceeded now 66C. Now, on AMD, generally I would try to recommend you want to stay under about 70C, ideally even under about 60C. Um, while that's definitely not a critical point in terms of causing a failure or any type of damage to the CPU, you know, there's going to be different comfort levels. The other option, of course, is that I could go into our, my fan expert software and go ahead and kick on the fan to a higher rotating speed. But for right now, I'm just going to go ahead and knock that off there, and I'm just going to go ahead and hit apply. And so we can see here that it's now gone ahead and applied 3.9 gigahertz. Now we can see that actually one of our workers did stop, which would indicate that we might have gone a little bit too aggressive in terms of the actual frequency. So at that point, either I could maybe put a little bit more voltage, or I could make some other adjustments, or I could increase the cooling, because it might be that at that frequency, I just need to keep the temperature actually a little bit colder to ensure uh, better stability. Or what I can go ahead and also do is maybe drop it down a little bit. I can go 3.8, reset that, close out of prime, and then go ahead and relaunch it. You definitely wouldn't be able to do this if you were keeping yourself all locked into the UEFI and limiting yourself in that respect. So now I've gone ahead and relaunched Prime95. We can see now it's fully reaccessing all six cores again at that new adjusted frequency. This is really convenient, really easy way in terms of overclocking your platform. Once you've gone ahead and completed then all your recording stress tests, you could then easily go ahead and go into the UEFI, dial in these values if you wanted to, save that as a profile, and you'd be locked and good to go. So you can definitely see that you can get quite a bit more performance out of your system um, utilizing some of our exclusive tools that are available here on ASUS motherboards. So if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, you guys are interested in seeing more information on the options for the Digi Plus VRM, what does what, or anything just relating to that, definitely let us know. Leave it on the YouTube page or go ahead and check us out at asusrog.com forward slash forums.